everyone knows what a cyber attack is and why they are a threat. They're when computer systems are invaded or hijacked. What we saw last week was a strategic move by Russia over the internet, over Zoom, striking into areas completely unprotected by virus and malware protection software. On August 22nd, using the platform that nearly everyone has used for the past three years, Vladimir Putin launched a major offensive against the West. That offensive was opened with the statement declaring, quote, the objective and irreversible process of de-dollarization, end quote. He proceeded to attack interest rate increases by Western Central Banks. He claimed that of the grain exported under the Black Sea grain deal, only 3% went to poor countries. And he announced 50,000 tons of free food aid to African countries. This is the most insidious sort of cyber attack because it is not what everyone is expecting. And it was only the tip of the iceberg of the strike that the Moscow Beijing Tehran Alliance made against the Kiev Washington Brussels Alliance during the meeting of BRICS nations last week. BRICS standing for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. President Xi gave a speech in South Africa, and he announced a BRICS satellite surveillance network, ostensibly to fulfill UN sustainable development mandates. The attack on the alliance supporting Kiev was given its philosophical underpinning by Brazilian President Lula da Silva, who referred to that Western alliance, to the nations who are supplying arms to Ukraine, when he said, quote, those largely responsible for the carbon emissions that caused the climate crisis were those who carried out the Industrial Revolution and fed a predatory colonial extractivism. They owe a historic debt to planet Earth and humanity. End quote. He then went on to justify, what, to use what he had said to justify, quote, the creation of a currency for trade and investment transactions between BRICS members increases our payment options and reduces our vulnerabilities, end quote. Obviously, the Western powers, the Western colonial powers, made errors, and that is beyond debate. What is occurring here, though, is not a discussion of the colonial eras. It is a justification to support the Russian war effort. And I want to pause briefly so the entire audience wouldn't understand what BRICS is, because that is key to why this attack on the Ukraine war effort is so effective and deadly. And by deadly, I mean people dying. Because of what these nations did, Ukrainians will die. Russians will too, but Ukrainian civilians will die. 
Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are all, quote, developing economies with huge potential that sometimes get sidelined by the current power players in the room, the U.S., the European Union, and the Japanese. Right now, the leadership of BRICS is fairly to the left and anti-Western. Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping of China both hold the West at arm's length on a good day. South African President Ramaphosa is an avowed socialist who was part of the leftist-leaning ANC during the Cold War. And uh, President Lula da Silva of Brazil is a committed leftist. He is well known for his left-leaning, left-wing point of view. Now, the BRIC nations uh, market themselves as an alternative to the Western status quo. Now, these nations are very significant. They're very important nations in terms of population, natural resources, economic clout, spending, and even arms production. You don't get bigger. Very few Americans are aware of the level of maturity, for example, that the South African, Indian, and Brazilian defense industries have achieved. For example, India and South Africa have developed nuclear weapons, although South Africa dismantled theirs, and both India and Brazil have aircraft carriers. But the BRICS meeting in South Africa that just wrapped up was used by President Putin and Chairman Xi as the opening of a massive counteroffensive against the Biden administration and NATO. This is focused on the war in Ukraine, but it goes beyond that. As of January next year, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and Ethiopia will be members of the BRICS bloc. This is significant. And it's especially significant right now since it undercuts everything the U.S. and NATO are trying to accomplish with their actions against Iran and Russia. If you want a better picture of the significance of what this means for the U U war in Ukraine, um, watch the past three videos I put up. They really focus on the Iranian connection, which makes this a world war. And this demonstrates it's very clearly a world war. Uh, for the moment, I just want to briefly dig into each of these new BRICS members and what their membership means specifically for the war in Ukraine and how it demonstrates that China and Russia are attempting to use the war to draw the line between the West and themselves, between Western democracies and Eastern nations, which and on um, our lesser democracies, which is putting it charitably. Uh, first, I want to quote a statement from President Lula da Silva's press release on the BRICS meeting, quote, about the creation of a business currency, an idea that the president has been mentioning in interviews and international meetings. Lula said the idea is not to change the existing country's currencies but to create a currency that allows parity negotiation within international trade, eliminating the use of dollars to this end, end quote. That is a statement that President Putin and Chairman Xi intend to try and sideline the dollar in some way. They couldn't say that. By getting President Lula to say that, it's coming from the leftist president of Brazil. So he gets less flack. Now, these nations can do this. Brazilian sugar and meat, Russian oil, Chinese and Indian manufacturers and or pharmaceuticals, South African coal. All of these could pro provide an alternative for fiat currency, which is what the U.S. dollar is right now. In other words, these nations could offer investors a note, a paper note, that is backed by an actual ton of coal or a slab of meat instead of just the, quote, full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Actually, some of these currencies could have even be backed by precious metals like platinum, silver, or gold. 
Now there's another aspect to this that one could literally fill a college semester course with, which is how the, the, the world, this part of the world, views Western democracies and their strength um, in light of our, like the French political distress, the American political division, but that's that's a whole, that is a like I said you could do a college course on it, but right now what we need to focus on is that unlike the Western economies, all of these nations are hardcore mineral and resource economies. They're not service-based economies. Western economies are rapidly becoming service-based. These are not, as NATO countries pretty much literally go to war with Moscow and threaten China or at least designate them as a really big source of concern. There's a lot of incentive for the BRICS nations to push back, and they are. Now, that's the threat. Let's look at each nation joining BRICS, and we'll see how this could affect the war in Ukraine. Now, obviously, the effect of the Iranian membership, membership is simple. It's an effort to sidestep Western pressure on Iran and undercut sanctions. Remember, this is the nation that was filled with riots because a young Kurdish woman in her 20s died in jail because she didn't have her head scarf on correctly. President Lula's press release about the announcement highlighted a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Iranian president at the BRICS summit and specifically point out the trade relationship between the two nations. Brazil imports oil, Iran exports oil, so here's another voice added to the reduction of sanctions on Iranian petroleum. A seat at the BRICS table would be a, quote, legitimization of the Tehran regime, and a way to close the gap between it and several other new members. And one of those new members is Saudi Arabia. I'm not saying this would be uh, this would put Saudi Arabia and Tehran playing nice, but this entrance of the Saudis into BRICS is a big deal, especially right now. This will make all of the kingdoms from Iran go away, but it significantly demonstrates how little they value the Biden White House. Two months ago, I posted a video about the Live PGA golf merger and discussed in it how the American political left are not fans of the Saudi royal house, and the Saudis apparently aren't fans of the American government either. Now, Egypt, the UAE, and Ethiopia invitations places these three key players in the mid and near east in a position with one less incentive not to play ball with Washington. The UAE is a dynamo in international relations, finance, and diplomacy. Their economy is strong in oil, gold, and diamonds, all of which could back an alternative to the U.S. dollar, and their military is second to none. Their 200 frontline fighter planes are Mirages, Raphaels, and F-16s. They field 400 main battle tanks and nearly 2,000 armored fighting vehicles. And this country has already deployed them across the region in some very hot war zones. Egypt is as significant as Saudi Arabia, since it's a long time very close ally to the U.S. in the region. No nation in the region is as historically, economically, and militarily developed as Egypt. They have always been at the center of Near East politics, beginning with the pharaohs, uh, continuing through biblical history, through the history of Alexander, through the history of the Caesars, uh, the Suez Canal is a major reason they are at the center of the economy of the globe. And if you look at the Arab nationalist movement led by Nasser and Sadat, it makes it clear Egypt is a very heavy hitter. Both Egypt's defense industry, the Suez Canal, and their relationship with Israel make it a regional pace setter. Of course, there's Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is a country most Americans know far too little about. There's so much going on there. This nation is the rumored home of the Ark of the Covenant, 
and the royal house boast its lineage from King Solomon. It was never conquered by the Europeans. Uh, Mussolini invaded during the Second World War, and World War and occupied it, but he didn't conquer it. It emerged after the Second World War as the leader in the African Union. They produced gold and very good coffee. Once again, these are potential basis for a non-fiat currency. The loss of Eritrea and the struggles in Tigray really do not give a full picture of Ethiopia's importance. Ethiopian troops are the ones who went into Somalia and helped put a government in place. Ethiopia, they are this invitation increases their prestige and they're going to work with to fit in this new block finally i want to look at argentina very quickly uh it's a new south american member of BRICS and a surprisingly vibrant nation that has had a string of very bad economic luck china's close relationship with argentina was outlined by a Bloomberg article a year ago detailing Chinese investment in hydroelectric energy, fertilizer production, electric batteries, and perhaps, perhaps most significant right now, lithium production. Now, wrapping up, anybody talking about this, and I don't know how many people are, will point to this development as discouraging. And yes, it is discouraging. But I'm going to suggest the expansion of BRICS is a sign of the success of the Biden White House's strategy. And that the Biden White House, the Western Alliance, is on the road to victory in Ukraine by going through the Persian Gulf. The question becomes, if the administration has the wherewithal to sustain the effort against Tehran. We have far more cards in our hands than Moscow, Tehran, or even Beijing will ever have. But whether these cards remain in the deck or we play them remains to be seen. And this is, this is a good time to quote an old adage that says, If you're taking flack, it's a good sign you're over the target. Is that we 